You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast, where we dig into the story behind the stories and behind the storytellers. Find all our episodes at hankgarner.com. Well, thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories podcast. This week's guest is Jason Gurley. Uh, Jason is the author of a new book called Eleanor uh, and the author of many other titles. Uh, But uh, it's good to have you with us this week, Jason. Thanks. It's really fantastic to be here. Well, thank you. Uh, To get started, uh, you know, we on this podcast are uh, trying to uh, do something a little different in that... uh, I really want to focus on authors and the the story of of their life and and how they uh, got into writing and what the the art means to them and that sort of thing. So I, I want to begin by asking you, uh, how did you get into writing? What was the catalyst to get you uh, to put your thoughts on page for the first time and have the uh, the will to share them with the rest of the world because that is a a huge uh, hurdle uh, for a lot of us is just you know getting the nerve to to you know bear our soul and, and then share that with the rest of the world kind of how did you get started and kind of what's your story on that you know I, we could go back as far as you want to go um, you know I wrote my very first story when I was five or six years old I think um, but I don't think I really seriously attacked writing until I was in high school yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd sort of moved about from uh, one school to the next. And uh, in my junior and senior year of high school, I learned that I was missing a couple of elective credits that didn't transfer from, from one state to the next. And I had the opportunity to choose between uh, a creative writing course or a, I think, I think they called it a consumer math course, yeah. which was, you know, here's how to balance your checkbook. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, divide a few fractions, that sort of thing. Sure. So I chose the creative writing course, and I, I had been reading adult literature ever since I was a small kid, um, and I just had a deep desire to write stories like the ones I was reading. And I was, I was very fortunate. I had a teacher um, uh, in, in that creative writing course, um, and I reconnected with her recently. But she encouraged me to... Uh, to sort of skip the homework that everyone else is doing and skip all of the normal assignments and just develop my my short story craft. And she would just grade me on the effort. And uh, that was probably the most rewarding and um, enlightening experience that I had as, as a writer to that point. And uh, I started taking it seriously at that point. And shortly after high school, I wrote my first novel. And the rest has just been that nice, familiar, long slog that we're all used to. <laughs> So when you wrote that first novel out of high school, what did you do with it? Well, I I did send it around a little bit. I was pretty proud of it. I was yeah. 18. I thought I'd written the next, you know, Mysteries of Pittsburgh or something. <laughs> right. And uh, the great American novel. Yeah, in retrospect, I hadn't written anything even remotely close to that. And I'm I'm very I I can't tell you how often I look back at those times and I am grateful that nobody said yes <laughs> to me. Uh, I'm grateful that that novel is still uh, sitting very firmly in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I totally, totally understand. Uh, so what happened with that process? Did you, uh, so I, I'm assuming that you started collecting rejection slips and like we all do, and uh, did, did you decide to... Uh, to move on to the next book or you know how did you uh keep the motivation to keep going um you know i wrote that first novel so quickly i think i was just excited by the process and i did go straight into the next book and the next book and then in those three years right after high school i wrote three novels and um i did collect rejection slips um i took an inordinate amount of pride in those rejection slips. I had them on the wall <laughs> the way I thought authors were supposed to do. And, right. um, you know, again, yeah. in retrospect, looking back, uh, I'm not entirely sure that was the most, <laughs> the most useful thing to do with those slips. Yeah, but it's, um, it's you know, there, there's something kind of rewarding in, uh, you know, putting that middle finger to the world, 
you know, collecting those rejection slips, I think. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, you can say no, but I'm not going to stop that sort of thing. That's <laughs> right, nice. Right, right, yeah. I did get a really wonderful rejection uh, from the fiction editor of Esquire right really? around that time. I think it was Adrian, Adrian Miller. Uh, she sent me a nice handwritten note about one of my stories, told me she wanted to see more, and uh, that was that's literally the only rejection I can remember clearly. And that was very encouraging. Um, you know, I was 21 or so, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and I just kept going. It, it was maybe a tiny bit of fuel to keep me from, from maybe considering those rejections too, uh, too carefully. Yeah. So what would you describe as... Uh, as your primary uh, genre that you like to write in, or uh, is there a, a recurring theme that you hit on within your with your books? Sure, I guess. Um, you know, those those very first novels are very different from the ones that I've published in the last two years. Um, they they were very uh, literary in nature. They were striving for, I think, that sort of great American novel that you described. Sure. Um, but since then, well, I should give you a tiny bit of, um, of preface here. Okay. Uh, after I finished those three novels, I started working on Eleanor. That okay. was 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. Yeah, I think you, you've been working on Eleanor for 13 years, I heard. Is that right? <laughs> 13 years, yes. That's amazing. Um, I'm... I, I, honestly, I, I can't tell you how I managed to stick with it, considering those first three novels came so quickly and effortlessly. Uh, but I did stick with it, and it took a very long time, and the novel kept shifting underneath me. So about 12 years in, I decided to take a very short break, what, what I thought would be a short break, and write something else just to remind myself that I knew how to finish something. And I wrote The Man Who Ended the World, and I self-published that, and then just became hooked on the immediacy of reaching readers, and so I published a few more books very quickly. And those books are I incredibly different from uh, what Eleanor was intended to be and what those early novels were. Um, I would have to say, if I had to classify myself, well, I could tell you what people describe me as, okay. people that I know have described me as. Um, they call my particular genre weepy science fiction <laughs> uh, because I have a tendency I think to go very character focused and very small with the stories yeah. and I'm always looking for that that nice hard hitting uh, emotional impact for myself and if, if I manage to do that well um, I think the reader I think the reader will feel that and I've, I've had a few stories that um, if you were to read the reviews from, from some of those readers you would think I went in there just tearful guns a-blazing hoping to <laughs> mow everyone down in a haze of, of emotional bullets and that was never the intent but that it went that way that it went so um, personal for so many people I think was um, that was a nice byproduct well I'll tell you I, I stumbled on Eleanor uh, when I published my first book Bloom uh, the main protagonist love interest is named Eleanor and I, I was flipping through Amazon one day and I, and I saw that book and I was like oh wow that's amazing I'm going to buy it and I one clicked it and and I you know saw the cover blurb and, and stuff and this was a few weeks ago and and I didn't know you as as the cover artist guy at the time uh, but I thought you know that that cover looks like it's got that uh, that girly look, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, but I didn't know that's what it was at the time. Uh, but anyway, I was like, yeah, it's a great cover, and and oh, what a cool name. And I started reading it, and I couldn't put it down, and I was just overwhelmed by the story. Oh, thank and, you. And it was, um, uh, I, I can't even put it into words. It was, uh, I think I, I emailed you and I told you that I got the same kind of impact from it that I got from Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Uh, and the uh, sort of, uh, I think, lyrical prose is, is probably too flowery a description. But, uh, you know, your way with words is, is just amazing. And, um, and to me, it was a really hard-hitting story, but at the same time, very personal. 
and and I could tell that it was crafted with with much love and care. Um, so, are you telling me that did I hear this right that you you've been working on this book for uh, fourteen years and it was it was twelve years before you decided to self publish one of those? Were were you just strictly working on Eleanor all of this time, or did you have other projects that you were doing? Kind of what what were you doing? Uh, in your day job and things, <laughs> and, and how were you maintaining the fire to write? Well, I'll, I'll address the day job okay. part first. And ac- actually, let me say um, thank you for those very nice words about the book. I'm, I've heard a lot of wonderful comments just like that, and that really makes me feel like I did my job uh, well, and I, I, I managed to do what I was aiming for with the book. Um, I... I have always wanted to be a writer, uh, but I always had a knack for design as well. And uh, when I discovered that and put it in, into practice, I discovered that um, I, I was just sort of a natural fit for uh, the graphic design and, and advertising field. So I, I've spent the past, I think, 15 or 16 years working as a designer and a creative director, an art director, that sort of thing. And, uh, and that's very richly rewarding and very fulfilling and um, it's incredibly challenging. You have to shift every couple of years and make sure you're still uh, keeping up with the, the very rapidly changing landscape. Uh, but in the evenings and on the weekends and sometimes in the very wee hours of the day, I would, I would or the morning, I would write um, Eleanor. And I did keep going for 12 years. And during most of that time, I was not sending... Eleanor or anything anywhere. I was quietly just working on the book. Um, I wasn't reaching out to agents or publishers or anything like that. Um, I took a, a short break from writing the novel, I think back in 2010 or 2011, and I attempted to turn it into a graphic novel. And that worked for a little while, and I published it online every week. And uh, and the, the archives are still out there for anyone who wants to go find them. Um, but the, the graphic novel was incredibly time-consuming, even, even more than the novel itself was. I think I spent up to 16 hours per page because I'm, I'm not a comics artist, and um, I was learning as I went. But, uh, but I took a break from the novel to try it that way, and when that wasn't quite clicking, I went back to writing the novel again. And somewhere in there is when I started to hear a little bit about uh, self-publishing and, and how it was taking off. Um, you know, I hadn't been paying attention to any of this. I knew people who had self-published in the years between, you know, th- when I first wrote my first novel and and Modern Day. And most of them had predictably bad experiences because we didn't have the ease of self-publishing then that we do now. Sure. Um, so I watched people get burned, and I watched the quality of their work. Just uh, it didn't quite shape up in the final package, and um, I even made a, a run at that myself with a book of short stories back in the early two thousands, and uh, and it just pretty much died on the table. So I I wasn't really thinking about publishing so much as I was thinking about just trying to finish this this massive book and I was never convinced at any point that I was actually going to do it so did you um, when you decided a couple of years ago to put this first book out uh, and, and you said you had to, an immediate uh, you enjoyed the immediate response from it and the uh, when you decided to, to self-publish uh, The Man Who Ended the World uh, was that a was that a full novel that you had written? How did you come to write that when you were, uh, you know, still had Eleanor you're working on and, and doing the day job? What was, uh, what brought that idea to you, the the man who ended the world? Well, my wife actually pointed out that Amazon was running a, a novel competition, and I had never heard of it before. It's their annual uh, breakthrough novel uh, contest. Yeah. Right. And I thought, you know, oh, the timing is terrible on this. It was... It's the, always terrible. <laughs> it was the end of November, I think, 2012, when I heard about it, and the deadline was early January of 2013. And Eleanor was still many, 
many thousands of words are being finished. I, I knew the ending, or what I thought at the time was the ending, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. And I, I sort of weighed my options. I could either try to rush Eleanor to the finish to meet this arbitrary, out-of-nowhere deadline for this contest that I'd never heard of before. Right. Or, I, or I could set it aside and just try to write something fun and, um, and see if I could actually hit the deadline. And it wasn't much different from NaNoWriMo. The, yeah. the minimum entry for the contest was 50,000 words. And I thought, you know, if I, if I focus really hard, I might be able to make this happen. And so I got to work. And when I considered the kind of story I might want to write, uh, I went back to end of the world stories. And, uh, you know, I've always had a soft spot for things like The Stand or Earth Abides or Alas yeah. Babylon and, um, you know, anything that doesn't necessarily feature zombies or vampires. <laughs> nice. I, was, I was totally into. So I thought I'd try my hand at a story like that. And uh, I didn't outline. I just dove in and went for it. And uh, the, the book came very quickly. And I think I was done in about three weeks' time. Amazing. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever written that fast in my life. How, how many words, roughly, are you talking about in that book? I want to say it's around 55,000 or so. Like, it yeah. barely cleared the minimum level. Uh, the, the Still, minimum three period. weeks, that, that's amazing. You're cranking out some, some serious uh, word counts. Yeah, I was, I was up late a lot of nights for, for the whole yeah. time. Um. So, yes, so that's what I did. I, sub I, um, I finished it, and then I decided uh, not to enter the contest after all. And the reason I did that is, you know, I, I don't have a, a habit of winning contests. I don't know about you, but when I enter something, I tend to never hear another <laughs> thing about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that's probably most people's experiences. Absolutely. But I realized that if I wanted to try my hand at self-publishing... This was a great time to do it. I had a book that was ready to go. I had no readership to speak of. Um, I Zero, really. I had family, and that was about it. And, right. um, and it couldn't hurt anything to try it. And if it failed, then you know, so be it. I'll, I'll just quietly take my little book and go home. Uh, and, it, and it did, you know, it didn't blow down the doors, but it sold, you know, 64, 65 copies in the first month out. And that was revelatory for me. I could not believe that it happened. Absolutely. So I immediately kept Eleanor on the to-be-completed later pile, and I started working on the next book. Um, what is it about the end-of-the-world stories do you think uh, resonates with the people? Uh, I, you know, I, I think um, if a if a story is really told well in that framework, you get to really highlight uh, the human elements of the story. It's it's like everything in the world is being stripped away, and then what do these characters do? Do you think that's uh, a fair assessment of kind of the love for apocalyptic literature? You know, I do. And for me, I think it's it's a very inward-focused story. And I'm well aware that the man who ended the world is the perfect example of end of the world stories that I don't love. I, not that I don't enjoy writing that story, but um, my favorite stories really are reflective. And um, I suppose they, they look into the character to see what kind of emotional weight they're, um, they're shouldering now because they've witnessed what they've witnessed and they're changed by simply being alone, or per perhaps mostly alone, in this new and very different world that they're faced with. Um, I, I wanted to, um, to explore the idea of taking away from a person everything that they held dear and see what was left. And while I don't think that the man who ended the world quite nails that, um, you know, because that was a very, I, I want to say, kind of pulpy um, sci-fi little thriller story. Um, I have explored that in a few of my short stories since. And uh, 
I, one that resonates with people very much is a story that I wrote called Wolfskin. And that's a story about a boy uh, who is transformed at, at, the, at the end of the civilization as we know it um, from being a perfectly ordinary suburban boy into one of these sort of faceless marauder types that we see in so many end of the world books. And I really wanted to look at somebody and, and understand like, how, how could you transform them from the, uh, the genuine family loving person they were into someone who can cut another person's throat in a heartbeat or who runs raids with other people on the few survivors who, who are left. And uh, that story, it took a very interesting turn and went very, very deep into uh, the, the protagonist's uh, mind and soul, I think. And people really seem to enjoy that, that quieter look at, at how a person is affected by the end of all things. And, um, and so it's become a sort of a recurring theme in a lot of my stories is, is this, this person who stands alone at the edge of something. Um, and, and, you know, it's, you could really look at that classic quote about staring into the abyss and, and the abyss staring back into you. I want to reflect what they're feeling uh, against the, against the, uh, the mirror of their circumstance. It's, it's a terrible thing to envision all of us just being gone in a heartbeat for whatever reason. But the ones who are left, you know, how do they go on? What does it do to them to, to go on? Have you gotten much uh, feedback from people who've read those stories and, and have those stories resonated with them? I think so. I, the Man Who Ended the World, I think everyone appreciates for, for what it is, which is uh, kind of a, it's a little bit silly, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's very, um, I, you could almost call it a, a darkly comic look at the end of the world. Uh, yeah. But for stories like Wolfskin or uh, The Caretaker or The Dark Age, other stories where I've explored that, that same concept of, of someone just being stripped of everything that they thought they could count on, uh, people do seem to really enjoy it. And, and that's exactly the reason that I, that I find myself drawn to, um, to continuing to self-publish and, and, and share those stories because people are, they're there. They're literally a click away just waiting for something new to, uh, to enjoy. Absolutely. Uh, do you feel like uh, self-publishing has, uh, has been a good experience for you? I really do. I, I honestly, truthfully do. And, um, you know, I two years ago, nobody was reading my work. And today, I, you know, I, and I'm, no, I'm certainly no publishing superstar. I think I've sold maybe 40 or 50,000 copies of my, my books in those two years. And um, that's amazing to me. I, if you had told me two years ago that, that people would buy my work and, and talk about it to their friends and share it and, and leave wonderful reviews and, uh, and, and demand that I write more, I probably would have just laughed at you, but, but that's exactly what's happening. And the ability to self-publish has, um, has really made that possible for me. How many works have you published in this two-year window that we're talking about? Oh, um, five novels, I think, and uh, maybe five or six short stories. And um, I've been involved in a few anthologies along the way. You know, if you were to ask a traditionally published author if they uh, would consider putting out five major works and several smaller works within a two-year window, they would probably think you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, i got to say, though, I, I don't know if they would say that because they think it's a bad idea. I think, I think the, traditional, uh, the traditional model of publishing tends to... Uh, make it more difficult for an author to share that many works in a, a smaller window of time. I yeah, that that's my point. Is that uh, you know you look at uh, you know just just pick any out of the ether uh, you know like John Grisham is going to put out one book a year or one book every eighteen months, and and they don't want him to put out any more than that. You know, there's this this big machine in place to promote that work and 
it's it's on a very specific timetable and um, yeah I, I love how uh, self-publishing has put that connection with the fans uh, with the readers directly in in our hands and allows us to go uh, right to them and and to satisfy that that need that's out there it's it's pretty remarkable it really is and I I can't comment as much as as I would like to be able to on traditional publishing and the machine and and how people perceive it um, I haven't I haven't really been through it enough to say that you know the the rumors and and the things that I hear about it are are based in fact I'm sure for a lot of people they are and I'm I, I, I think I'd like to see for myself what it means to have a book considered for a traditional publishing deal uh, before I say that that's definitively a, a bad thing for sure. for my work. Yeah. Well, and I think that what's beautiful about the uh, uh, the atmosphere for publishing now is uh, is you have the option to do both. You know, we, there's so many uh, writers who have you know started as as self published and then get picked up by a uh, one of the big five or, or so and then they you know get to blend their their model and uh it really has put the power back uh with the authors uh which is a beautiful thing it definitely is and and i i will say that um being a self-published author is is like i said it's remarkable that i've had the ability to do um what i've been able to do in the past two years uh I also think that there are some things that are just simply too big or too demanding for me to do for myself. And those are the areas where I, I would like to reach out to someone for help, you know. Um, it's a difficult task to, say, get your books translated for overseas markets. You know, when you've got a, a publisher in your corner who can help you with that, I think you've got... Uh, You've got the ability to take advantage of all the strengths that they have and compare and, and combine them with the strengths that you have, and uh, and so that hybrid model that a lot of authors are exploring seems to be um, I don't even want to say a lucrative one so much as just a very a very it seems wise to be a beneficial well. one. Yeah, it, it definitely does because I I don't look at traditional publishing or the publishers um, who. <laughs> who said no to so many of my books for so long. Um, I don't look at that as, as necessarily an evil machine. I look at it as one that uh, is simply looking for uh, something that's going to make money and something that's, that's a sure bet, especially as they're going through this sort of shifting industry that we're in right now. Um, you know, it's, it's harder to take a risk on things now even more than it was before. Uh, but if you can show them that you have value, show them that, that your books uh, sell well, that there are readers who are enjoying them, and, and that sort of thing. If they're able to bring certain things to the table to help you take that farther, well, I think that's worth considering. And, um, and you know, I, I read a lot of things that other independent authors say um, about traditional publishing, and so much of it strikes me as uh, a very heels dug in kind of position against the idea without having ever been at the table considering what it can do for them um, before they make that decision. Very wise words. Very wise words. Uh, let's shift back to writing for, for just a minute. Uh, you said when you wrote your first book uh, that you just poured the book out, uh, didn't outline it or anything. Uh, are you an outliner or a seat of the pantser or as <laughs> george R. R. martin describes it uh are you an architect or are you a gardener how do you see yourself and what's your workflow like when writing you know i've i've always been a, a very unsuccessful outliner <laughs> i i will try to outline a book and then i'll just get impatient and i want to start it with eleanor uh you know i started writing that book all those years ago knowing what I wanted to try to say and what I wanted to try to explore and not knowing that much more than just the beginning and the ending. I didn't know how I would connect the two. I always had those two from the very start. Um, 
But those years went by, and the book shifted, and eventually, as, as it transformed into what it became uh, this past year or so, uh, the needs to outline became immense, and, and it came very late in the game. So I did re-outline Eleanor a couple of times in the past probably 10 or 12 months, uh, and then as I wrote to that outline, as I, as I finally bridged the gaps that I created in the, in the story, uh, I discovered that the story had legs of its own, and it would deviate from that outline. And the places that it went would be, those were the magical places, you know, when you don't expect it. And um, you know that you're writing a scene that's going to achieve X, and just before it gets to X, it takes a really hard turn to the right or the left, and it does something far more complex and far more interesting than what you had thought of when you wrote that outline in the first place. So I, I would definitely say I'm somewhere in between. I think I outline as it serves the process, and I feel perfectly free to crumble that outline up and, and move on from that when the opportunity presents itself. Gotcha. Um, where do your ideas come from? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, a story I always like to uh, a question I like to ask people because uh, you know, for me I get ideas from the weirdest weirdest places sure uh, sometimes it's dreams you know I'll wake up uh, and, and I'll have a dream and, and and I'll have a character in mind and then I'll I'll walk around and kind of stew on that for for days on end sometimes and then uh, all of a sudden you know I have a I have a story in my head um, but how where do those things come from with you? I think it's all over the place. Um, you know, I, I have a novel called The Settlers that... Um, yes. It's the first in a, a series that I, that I still haven't finished. Um, and some readers certainly want to uh, strangle me for not doing that yet. <laughs> um, that story literally came from a, a walk through Portland one day. And... Uh, I just I looked at a building and I thought, well, what if the building went down into the ground instead of straight up? And um, somehow that idea of, of people being isolated in a structure transformed into people being isolated on a space station. And I literally was thinking of like a skyscraper in space. Like, what would that be like? And that really bizarre and unformed idea became uh, sort of the, the groundwork for a story about mankind migrating away from Earth in waves and where they would go over the next few centuries or millennia. Uh, but then some of my stories are very grounded in personal experiences. Uh, Eleanor, uh, which I've, I've written about this a few times online, uh, but Eleanor has some very deep uh, personal roots for me. And those roots might not be as obvious to someone who is reading the final work, uh, but those roots are what fueled the story for more than a decade. And, uh, and I have a short story called The Dark Age that is, it, it's, it's very possible it's the most personal story I've ever written, and I'm not sure I could ever read it aloud to anybody. That's how, how deeply it still hits me when I look at it. Uh, but that was a story that I wrote about a father who travels to space on a lifelong journey the day that his daughter is born and, um, and what it's like for him to watch her grow up you know, through video chats and know that he's never going to see her again. And um, and then to know that he and his crew are going to go into a, a deep hibernation sleep for more than a century. And when he wakes up, her life will have played out and he won't have been around to, to see it. And that story I wrote uh, because, you know, I have a very young daughter myself. She's She's almost three, but... Um, was barely two years old when I wrote the story. And just the idea of going to work every day and thinking of all of the things that I would miss out uh, during the day while she was learning what her colors were and beginning to figure out how to dance or to say new words. These are things that, um, that, that I wouldn't get to see germinate dur during the day. And, um, you know, I, I'm very grateful that I get to come home every day and see my family and spend time with my, my daughter. Um, but being away during the day is still so difficult. And that story came very much out of that experience. I love that as a designer, the first thing that 
that you would have missed is your daughter learning her colors. <laughs> <laughs> she has a, a Pantone color book that she's obsessed with. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Oh, um, what about short stories? Uh, it seems to me that uh, short stories went through a very long dry spell uh, with some of the literary journals and things like that that sort of dried up over the years where you know, there used to be a big market for that. Uh, and then short stories, to me, seem to have just kind of gone away for a while. But with this new self-publishing and digital revolution, short stories are making a huge comeback. Um uh, what do you think about that? I, it's pretty great, I think. Uh, you know, I published a lot of short fiction, you know, 15 years ago. Um, if you if you go online and you and you search for my name and short story, uh, which I, I don't recommend anybody doing, <laughs> you'll find you know a hundred or more, um, usually fairly bad stories that I published online. You know, as I was still forming as a writer. Uh, these days. You know, I, I'm fortunate enough that I get these these wonderful invitations to participate in anthologies uh, all the time. Uh, you know, uh, David Gatewood is a fantastic editor who has sort of uh, discovered this knack for assembling uh, these terrific anthologies with authors like Michael Bunker and um, and Brian Spangler. And I've been fortunate enough to be a part of several of those. And uh, and it's it's just magical just to be able to take a short story uh, out into the world in so many different ways now. Um, you know, I, I tend to publish my short stories individually. Uh, I don't. Some authors don't like to do that. I I love to do it because at the end of the day, it's one more way for someone to discover um, what it's like to read my work and to do it in a very low impact way that doesn't consume a lot of their time. It's easy to pick up something like the Dark Age and, and to know at the end of it, or even halfway through it, if you even want to give something like Eleanor a try, based on the strength of the, the short form. And, um, and there's just something so, oh, it's just so pleasing to, to sit down at your computer, maybe in the morning, on a weekend, or late at night, and know that in a couple of hours, you can have something that you can share with readers just a day later. You know, the, the Dark Age was, um, I think, I, I'm, I'm sure not everyone would, would agree with me, but it being my most personal work, it's, it's one of my most favorite works as well. And that was written and, and self-edited, and the cover was designed, and the ebook version and the print version were both laid out and designed. Um, all of this in a period of about... 10 or 12 hours and the book was online the next morning and and getting reviews right after that and um, just the freedom to be able to do that so quick so quickly and just sort of fill a need for myself and also give someone something interesting and new to read is it's wonderful it is wonderful and that the story of of that story is amazing to me um when you set out to to begin a new work, do you know if it's a short story or if it's a novel, or <laughs> are you very deliberate about that? Uh, sometimes. I I'll, I'll give you an example right now. I'm working on something okay. um, that when I sat down to write it, it was going to be just a classic uh, flashback style horror story. Um, I, I discovered by accident that I actually kind of enjoy writing horror, and I wanted to write something that took place in the town that I grew up in, and uh, and it literally was just going to be a story about some boys who, on a very very hot day, sneak onto a, a neighbor's lot to use his pool. That's it. I was going to turn that into a horror story, and that evolved uh, from you know what I would be a 4,000 word story into, I think I'm around 20,000 words now, uh, into a story about the birth and death of the entire universe. And I can't tell you how that happened. And all I can tell you about it is that it revolves around trees. And I can't tell you how that happened either. And, um, 
and it's very definitely not a short story now. It might be a serialized novel, but it also might be a novel all on its own. It's I'm still figuring it out as I go. All I know is that it's one of the most fun things I've ever written. And that might just be because it's following on the heels of one of the longest and most um, painstaking things I've ever written. Um, and I just feel very free to explore it and see where it goes. What about the Eleanor sketches? Oh, so the El- tell me about those. <laughs> the Eleanor sketches um, are probably the only remaining um, example of what Eleanor was originally going to be as a as a novel. Um, you know, when I started writing Eleanor, it was it was a book about um, about a girl who dives from a cliff, has a terrible accident, and she goes into a coma. And while she's in a coma, she has a conversation with someone who might be God, might not be God. Whatever it is, it's a, it's a transcendent experience for her. And when she wakes up from the coma, that, that's a spoiler uh, for the book that never was, clearly. <laughs> when she wakes up from the coma, she finds that, um, that her real life is very desaturated. Like the color is just drained out of the world because that comatose experience she had uh, was so magical. Right. So the Eleanor sketches came about, I, I'll say probably seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, um, when I started to struggle uh, with Eleanor and, and where that novel was going, which that happened a lot and, uh, and for a very long time, the Eleanor sketches were my way of sort of working out the character herself. And so I had a blog at the time. And most of the time I would blog about, you know, things that made me happy or things that made me unhappy or uh, the blog is offline now and for good reason. Um, But the Eleanor sketches were something that now and then I would just write about the character. I would take her and put her into any kind of scenario that I could imagine that had nothing to do with the book. I would write Eleanor in a sketch where the apocalypse had happened and I didn't know how she was going to react. I would write a scene where Eleanor was grown up and she was married to her friend Jack, but she was betraying him and sleeping with other men. I would, it didn't matter what necessarily, um, what scenario I put her in. You know, I, I would just try to write from her perspective and see if I could just unlock something new about the character. And so over time, I think I published maybe 40 or 50 of these on that website. And, uh, and I, I had a small amount of readers at the time who, who loved them and were very excited about this book that I was working on that might feature these, these little sketches and, and small stories. Uh, little did they know, of course, they'd be waiting for another eight or 10 years for that book. Um, in any case, when I, when I published Eleanor, this year, I made it available as a as a pre order, and um, and I decided that as a special thank you to anybody who would take a chance on this book before it was available, um, I would give them a a digital copy of all of those Eleanor sketches bound into uh, uh, an unedited book, basically. And uh, it was very polished. I designed the whole thing uh, just as I would do with any other book, uh, but each sketch is presented in exactly the way that I wrote it then uh, with plenty of out of context uh, behaviors on Eleanor's part and things that she would never do now or in the novel as a, as a character. But it is pretty adventurous and it was a nice little gift that I could give people who, um, who believed in the book or, or believed that it was going to be something worth their time and who decided to order it uh, early. That is such a great idea. Um... I have, uh, when I was writing Bloom, uh, I edited out about 50,000 words. There were just things that were too personal for me or um, just things that I wanted to change or, you know, for whatever reason. But there's, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons that as you go through the editing process, you trim and you trim and you trim. That That's a... Uh, that's a great idea to repurpose some of those <laughs> stories that got cut out. That's uh, 
Excellent. Um, so when you um, when you're writing Eleanor and you have carried her around uh, for over a decade, uh, you know, and and I think it's great that you did these Eleanor sketches and you put her in situations to to see how she would react and and things like that. Do, do you think of her as a person? Uh, you know, when when you begin writing these characters, do they become uh, a, a part of you? To, or you know, is there some existential thing that happens when creating characters? Uh, I'm gonna say yes, even though I think that's perhaps a little more eccentric and strange <laughs> than I'd like to be. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, I've I've lived with with the concept of this novel and with Eleanor as a character uh, for more years than just about every friendship I've had as an adult. And, um, you know, I've, I've known Eleanor, I'm putting air quotes around Eleanor. Uh, sure. I've known her longer than I've known my wife. You know, I've, um, she's just, she's this character and she so deeply reflects me and things that I was going through when I conceived of, of her story um, that she's not, she's not a character I could ever let go of. So even when the novel got difficult and I couldn't tell where it was going, um, it was the strength of that character and, and my deep compassion for what, she was, what, what I was putting her through, I should say, um, that kept it going. And... Um, while I know I'll never write another novel with her in it, it's a character that I don't think will ever quite leave me. Is is that a spoiler that you'll never write another story with her? There, there is not going to be another <laughs> Eleanor. Um, <laughs> okay. And I, you know, I, I love, I love the idea that um, people want that from from her. I just. If you've read the book and you and you know how the book ends, yes. um, there's there's no story left to be told there. I if I were to stretch and try to tell the story, I think I would do a disservice to the novel and, and everything that it's trying to do. Uh, one thing I'll say uh, when I first started reading Eleanor, especially um, the world building really stood out to me, and and I don't know if world building is is uh, is a great uh, description uh, since you are describing a, a real place most of the time but I've never been to the Pacific Northwest and I definitely got a feel for the surroundings and I, and I felt like I had been there when I when I finished the book uh, especially those first few chapters uh, you know uh, does that come easily for you um, in the, the building the setting and, and things like that you know, when I started writing Eleanor, I was living in Reno, Nevada, and Reno could not be farther, you know, environmentally speaking, um, from the Pacific Northwest and its coast. And um, you know, I wrote this novel from many different places over those over those years, but I always had a very deep love for the Pacific Northwest. You know, I spent a lot of my life in Alaska. And the Pacific Northwest seemed to be just about the closest representation of the Alaskan experience here in the continental U.S. And um, so I, I wrote it partly as I had seen it during brief stops in the state and, and travels through it. But I also wrote it partly as I had built it up in my mind as this, this place where I could imagine myself being happy. Um, and... You know, when I started writing Eleanor from the very beginning, uh, I was at a, I was just, I, you know, I was sort of at a crossroads in my life. I was not a, a very happy person. Life was not quite turning out the way I wanted it to, and I was beginning to make choices to to change that, and they were very painful choices for me to make. So I think a lot of my my deep passion for this imagined Oregon went into the book. And um, now I live in Oregon now, and we've made trips as a family out to the coast a few times. And the, the coast as I see it there and the coast as it exists in the book, are they're quite different. Um, 
but you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you were me and you saw the difference between how I conceived it and the difference between the real place that I had built up in my mind to match it. Well, it is very, very well realized. And, uh, Thank you. It, it absolutely sucked me in. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful story. Thank you. Um, it, do you have a, a specific writing schedule? Uh, are you a daily writer? Are you, uh, are, are you one of these people that, that has to keep a regimen and, and keep going? Or, or do you just uh, wait for the muse to show up? You know, I used to wait for the. I, I used to sort of romanticize the idea of writing when the inspiration hit, and um, and as a consequence, I would sometimes not write for weeks at a time. Um, these days, it's it's less about the muse; it's more about just the desire to see a story through, um, and you know, having a, a very rewarding uh, career and having a family, and um, and being as active as I try to be in you know, local uh, writing events and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I'm not always writing every day. I write as often as I'm able, and I certainly, uh, I certainly can't build a, a schedule around my writing in any kind of um, consistent way. So I might be writing at 11 o'clock at night. I might be way too damn tired to do that. And uh, I might write, you know, for 15 minutes on a lunch break, or I might write in my car you know, uh, in the morning when I'm stuck in traffic, <laughs> you know, I just think to myself, uh, you know, this is what I'm doing. I, I have this habit of reciting um, to myself what I want to write later. And um, and when I get to a point where I can't keep up with my, my output and I, I can't remember the next line, then I just keep reciting what I've already got. And the next chance I have to sit down and write that, then it comes out and then I go from there. What is your toolkit like? Uh, is there any specific software that you use to write with? Uh, you know, the, the mechanics of writing. Are there any uh, little tips that you'd like to share or, or things that work for you? I've, I've been a dedicated Scrivener user probably for seven or eight years. Um, I, th I think it might be longer than that. I think I started using them right after I found out about them, which it might be 10 years now, I'm not sure. Um, I've used it for all those years. I still don't know half the things that I can do with Scrivener. And um, and I've had to learn to hack my way through it, uh, just like as a designer I had to learn to hack my way through Photoshop. And yes. that's made it a very um, rewarding partnership for me. <laughs> I like something that challenges me without making me hate it. And... Right. Uh, and and so that's that's probably the the most reliable thing that I've got. I don't tend to do a lot of writing outside of Scrivener. That's pretty much my be all end all. Do you write on a laptop on a desktop? Is there, what's your your uh, your desk like? Where's the <laughs> place that you go to 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 make it happen? Um, my desk is most often my lap or yeah. a coffee shop table or, or whatever. I take a laptop with me wherever I go. Um, when we moved into this, this house here in Oregon, uh, my wife and I carved up this uh, very large room. We named it Switzerland because it would be our, our neutral territory. <laughs> and so on the, the left half Love of the that. room is, is sort of my workspace, and on the right half of the room is her workspace. And mine is filled with... Um, everything from my, my sketching tools to a desktop computer. And, uh, and her side of the room is, is filled with yarn and spinning wheels and fiber and, and all the wonderful things that she makes and fills our house with. Um, and because she's a ninja knitter. Oh my is that right? God, she's an amazing knitter. And, and her interests go so far beyond just that. It's anything she can make with her hands that can be worn, um, she has experimented with and, and discovered all kinds of wonderful ways to make it. And uh, so we have this room that's sort of split between us. And my side of the room has all this framed artwork of space and, and so on. And her side of the room is, is covered with these wonderful um, local art uh, pieces that we discovered when we first moved here. And it's a beautiful room, and neither one of us uses it. <laughs> um, 
for for various reasons, but mostly like our life is just not quite as um, calculated, I suppose. Now we're both yeah. parents now, and um, you know that means that we just we don't actually have a lot of time to ourselves to do those things in in the isolation that that room is designed for us to do it in. So I I will write during the uh, you know the fifteen minutes that uh, that I have here and there, or um, if my wife and my daughter run a quick errand, I will write while they're gone, and then I'll stop when they get back, whether I'm in the middle of the sentence or not. Um, so it's it's very loosey goosey. I one day maybe I will have the wonderful writing environment that I envision in my brain. I don't right now, and that hasn't really slowed me down any. And um, I've discovered that. I don't really need that in order to create something. So what's your next project, Jason? <laughs> what are you working on now? Right now I'm working on a story. Uh, this is the one I mentioned earlier, the, the tree story, the trees that end the universe. Um, there's no simple way for me to talk about it without it sounding like the most inane thing I've ever written. Um, it's called tentatively it's called limbs um, and it's it's a story about uh, these enormous trees that uh, that are the beginning and end of of all things and uh, and the idea that the earth as as we know it is nothing more than the root ball that formed around the roots of these trees and, uh, and they've been around for billions of years. The universe itself is actually just a, a byproduct of these trees. And, um, and they've been threatened. And as they've been threatened by this external force, they've been slowly dying. And now there are only a few of them left. And they're so whittled down that they just look like ordinary trees here on Earth itself. And, um, and so I've been exploring this, this story where... Uh, this this ordinary guy has stumbled into this bizarre world um, of these trees and the and the species of of quasi humans, I guess, who who were created specifically to care for them, and there are very few of them left. And these trees, once they go, uh, the end of all things will will take place, and so it's. It went from being a, a small horror story about a swimming pool <laughs> to this this enormous canopy um, about about uh, you know, existence in general. And I, I honestly I have no idea where I'm going with it. All I know is that it is it is bizarre and entertaining for me to write. And if it never gets to a place where I'm happy to share it, I'm entirely okay with that. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to keep going and turn into something uh, pretty compelling. Um, it it looks like it might be the first thing I've written that has the ability to sustain many stories that are told in this world. And even though I'm not wild about writing a series or any kind of project that seems to stretch beyond a single book, uh, this one might not allow itself to stay that small. So. That's that's what I'm working on. I love it. I can't wait to read it. Um, where can uh, where can people find you, Jason? Can they go to your website? Yeah, jasongurley.com. That's G-U-R-L-E-Y. And, and I know you said that 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 previous blog that you wrote has gone away, but you you blog at your new website, don't you? I do. I do. About your love of Steve Carell movies and things oh, like that. Oh, God. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. <laughs> You, go, go read his blog and you'll you'll know what we're talking about uh jason thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to uh to spend with us tonight and we really appreciate it and everyone go to amazon and buy eleanor and uh the other uh numerous works that he's put out thank you jason uh, it's been a pleasure thanks so much for having me Thank you for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Tune in each week to hear interviews with the biggest and the best authors writing today. Find all of the podcast at hankgarner.com.